the, the aim of this presentation is to give you an insight in, in some of the SPLIST results. And uh, I will go through 10 key points in nine pillars. I will continue with giving you a pillar overview and results that we have found, found a country overview. Unfortunately, uh, the time is too short to give an, ov a an overview of all the countries. So I have to make a selection there. And I will end with a few preliminary conclusions as we are still uh, working uh, all our analysis up to a final uh, book that will be published uh, hopefully uh, halfway 2014. Now, I'm not going into the outputs anymore, but I just want to mention that I will continue on the figures that were used by Simon in terms of market share uh, and where the split countries are uh, ranked according to their market shares in summer sports. So France, Australia, Japan, in that order, they have performed in summer sports. And that is basically important to understand uh, the rest of the slides. Now, as Simon mentioned, we use market share, but to give you an idea of total medals over a four-year time period, um, France won 148 medals during World Championships and um, Olympic Games included in a four-year time period. Similarly, for winter sports, Canada is the most uh, successful country, followed then by Korea and the Netherlands and so on. So that is the data that we will use as a proxy for the measurement of success. And uh, although there are different measurements of success, Simon also showed that um, top eight or top 16 or top three in medals, it's all uh, related very much to each other. So at a certain point, you have to make a choice and that is the choice that we will make top three places for World Championships and Olympic Games. And the first statement was already mentioned by uh, Simon, more money in equals more medals out, but there is a small but that he showed by his change of um, change in medals and change in expenditures. And I want to go a little bit more in depth on that because that is useful to get an understanding of how do countries perform Given the, given the resources at their disposal. And when we look at the elite sport expenditures of all the countries we have in our sample, that varies a lot. Maybe I should start with saying what did we include as elite sport expenditures. We looked at nationally developed expenditures, which were the governments, the national lotteries, the NOCs, as far as they, don't, they were not included in the other two, and also national coordinated sponsorship. So sponsorship money, money that can be used by the National Sport Association uh, to, to develop elite athletes, so at the national coordinated level. Now, um, the elite sport expenditures vary from Korea uh, to Estonia from 8 million euros to 253 million euros. Although from Korea, this is one year, 2010 and 11, um, for Korea, it should be remarked that 50% of that budget was invested just for the organization of elite sport events. So we might need to exclude it from the total in order to be comparable with the other countries. They organized the Asian Games, they organized uh, a World Championships in Athletic, uh, so that, that is included in the budget. Now we can actually make three categories of those countries spending more than 150 million euros, Korea, Japan, and France uh, on elite sport. A second category of Australia, Brazil, Canada, and Spain uh, spending between 100 and 150 million euros, with a side remark of Brazil that spends uh, 135 million euros from taxes, government, and lotteries. But uh, what we did not include here is what is spent by the state companies. And the state companies in Brazil do invest a lot of money in elite sport. We did not include it because it's not nationally coordinated. It's they who decide to give funding to volleyball, to basketball, and so on. So it's not part of what we internationally compare. But it's probably more important in Brazil than it is in some other countries. Now, also important, an important detail is that what you see here in the back, you might not be able to read it, but it's just to mention that countries differ in what you can buy with 100 million euros. 
And there, therefore, we use PPP values, purchasing power parity values, which actually mean if I means if I would buy a box set, uh, sorry, if I would buy a box of goods in Switzerland, I would not say, pay the same amount of money for that same box of goods in Brazil. So there is an, an international comparison PPP value, but that is in international dollars, and that cannot be compared to any other value. So therefore. Just to mention that although Japan and Korea are pretty much close to each other, in their PPP values, the value of Korea is almost the double of Japan. And similarly, the Netherlands and Switzerland here are pretty close to each other, but in PPP values, the Netherlands actually spends more on a heat sport than Switzerland does. So this is a side remark that we may need to take into account. So, Going further on Simon's more money in equals more medals out and what he has presented, we can here see the elite sport expenditures and on the vertical axis the market shares by nations and where our nations are situated, we can actually see that there is a trend more money in, more medals out and that there is a quite high uh, relationship for the scientists among you, a correlation of above 0 0.8 is a very high uh, correlation but it's only, of course, uh, 60 countries involved in this. Um, now, the reason why I show this slide again is basically what interests us is how the nations perform given what they invest in elite sport. And here we can see that the most efficient nations are Australia, France, and the Netherlands because they are above that line and also a little bit Japan. And the least efficient nations for summer sports are Korea, although if we would exclude the 50% spent on elite sport events, Korea would be somewhere around here, so probably around this regression line. Uh, Canada, Brazil, that does not uh, perform in winter sports, but did in summer sports under their expectations, and Switzerland. Of course, we have countries that prioritize summer sports. Some countries prioritize winter sports. So therefore, we separately do this analysis for winter sports. And this, ana this relationship is less clear for winter sports between money in and medals out. But it is still strong, uh, the relationship. And if we would look only at what nations give to their national governing bodies, in winter sports, then the relation becomes again much stronger. So it's just to conclude that more metal, money in equals more medals out. Being the most efficient nations in winter sport, Canada, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and also Finland uh, performing above this regression line. Now another key point about money is, so does that mean that if my government would invest three times as much money, that they would also invest Three times, uh, win three times more medals, and that is what uh, Simon already concluded. That is, it is not the case, and one of the reasons why this is not the case is because all countries have increased their investments over a longer term period. If we look since 2001 until 2012, and here the percentages are written, elite sport expenditures have increased in all these countries since the beginning of this decade. And by now, one exception is interesting that is Spain. It can be assumed that Spain, we find a, a slight decrease here, is Spain. We find a slight decrease after 2008, so it could be that Spain is one of the countries that suffered most from uh, the economic crisis uh, after 2008. But similarly, also for smaller countries, where we can see that elite sport expenditures basically have increased in almost every country, with a few exceptions, uh, Estonia and Denmark. So, um, as a conclusion to that, it does not automatically lead to more success. And what basically counts is that nations should not compare to what they did in the past, but they should compare with other competitors. And if they are growing faster, they, they cannot influence their success or their improve their policy to the level uh, that they would like to. A second statement is that um, more efficiently organized countries also perform better. And in this pillar, we measured 18 critical success factors, 119 sub-factors. But in my previous <coughs> presentation, I needed to make a comment. 
and that is that for the next of the results that I will pre be presenting, unfortunately, not a few countries were not able to do our full analysis. So with regard to the results of France, that will not be included now, because they did not participate in the Elite Sport Climate Survey. They answered all the questionnaires with the nine pillars, but not their athletes, coaches, and performance directors. And so there are two more exceptions. Estonia participated in the climate survey and only did pillar one, which I just showed. But for the other pillars, they only had the climate service. And Korea uh, also did the climate with their uh, elite athletes, but did not answer a few pillars, which were three, the sports participation, the talent, um, and international competition were not completed by Korea. Just that you know that if you have a question on the next slide, why is France not included? I will include that at the end of the presentation, but actually their scores are not comparable. So what we did is we developed a scoring methodology for all the critical success factors, and we come to a final score, which is a percentage score. Now, interesting to see this slide is that exactly those countries in the previous slide where I said they perform better than what we would expect based on their investments made in elite sport, well, it are also exactly these countries that do so well in the organization and structure and governance of elite sport. So the Netherlands, Australia, Japan was also above it given its resources were the summer sports more efficient nations. Canada, Switzerland were seen as uh, performing better than their resources in winter sports. So it's pretty interesting to see that how these countries have a national coordinated approach towards elite sports policies that that also um, reflects in their number of medals won. And on the other side, uh, Brazil, Wallonia, Portugal are the countries <coughs> that do less good in terms of national coordination. I will later come back on some uh, level of uh, Brazil. Uh, a correlation that is also very high, and here we can see it in terms of, I, I used a green traffic light for a successful country, a red traffic light, an orange traffic light, and I hope you can see it well with the lights. Uh, but you can see that there is a kind of trend in nations that do better <coughs> than others. There are also a few exceptions. These are here, um, Korea, that is not so strong in the national coordination of their elite sports policy over the whole country. They do have their national training center, but it's not very coordinated compared to, for example, the Netherlands and Australia. Um, and also Finland is basically a country that focuses on a decentralized elite sports policy and it might be that they could also benefit from uh, supporting more on a national basis uh, with services and support services. The key ingredients of this pillar, uh, and I will not do that for every pillar, just for a few, but it's interesting to see which ones were significant or highly related, is the full-time management staff at the National Sport Association. The National Sport Association is like UK Sport or NOCNZ in the Netherlands. Um, which is, this factor is, pride, is actually a proxy of elite sport funding. Uh, it's related to how much money countries have. But important is also a strong coordination of all activities and financial inputs. So what do we mean with this relationship? Countries that do better, that coordinate better, are also the countries that perform better. But what I found interesting is that it's not the countries that centralize the most that are successful. It's the country that coordinate the most that is successful. And that is an important difference between two. We also see that countries with only one organization responsible for elite sport do better. Involving the stakeholders in the elite sport development, which means involving the athletes, the coaches, uh, in the development prior to your uh, to developing your strategic plans and afterwards and also listening giving them a voice uh, appears to be um, an important factor and also the fact that they are represented in important decision making structures and then uh, and national sport associations tend to try to give more services uh, and have objective criteria for the funding that they give to their national governing bodies. Interesting to know is that uh, 
when a factor is well scored by all countries, it will not be significant, but it doesn't mean it's not important. So long-term planning of the league sport policies and communication with athletes. So in summary, basically these factors summarize what are within pillar two, the key ingredients of more successful uh, nations. A third statement regards the sports participation. We did not find that a broad sport participation would be required for achieving international success. And of course that needs comments, and I'm, I'm, I, it would probably need a separate presentation to show all the results of that pillar. But uh, continuing, it may influence uh, success on the long term because of the continuous supply of young talent and a higher level of training. And um, I will not go much into depth on it, but we hardly find any relationship between physical education at school and school sports, between sports participation and between quality and what, what is national coordinated regarding quality in uh, sports clubs. The best scores are found in Switzerland, Denmark, France and Finland, and the worst scores in Brazil and South Korea. Um, but the scores do not differ that much. Now the comment we need to make about that is, what does it mean? Is sports participation not important for success? Based on our results, we cannot confirm that. So it means that if countries would, make, would need to make a choice where to invest in medals, pro, pillar three sports participation would probably not be their priority. But the side comment to be made is two things. First of all, all our countries of our sample are countries that basically have a good sports participation, with the exception of Brazil. So when the sports participation is high in most countries, we cannot uh, find differences. And the second is, what do we actually measure? We measure national sports participation at an overall level. And what it means is that countries that do not perform well in Olympic Games or World Championships might also have good scores on sports participation. So it would be too easy to say sports participation is not important. No, it's not the first priority when having to invest in elite sport. If we would have a sample of less developing countries, it's probably the first priority uh, to invest in. The fourth statement, talent development and identification is still an underdeveloped area. And it is better developed in smaller countries. So when we go to the, through the scores of uh, this pillar, we can actually see that, first of all, the average is around 40%, which is quite low, much lower than in the other pillars. And uh, there are three countries with a green score on this. This is yellow, so it might be the light or so. And I hope for the next slides that it does not influence too much. But the countries that actually have a good score are Flanders and Switzerland uh, in these pillars. Flanders, for example, because of the system of elite sports and study, where students can easily have a combination of elite sport with their studies, and this is all nationally coordinated. Uh, although it also has weaknesses, of course, but at a national level evaluated, and then also the Netherlands do pretty well. Now, it might not come to a surprise that smaller countries do better in pillar four, and it is also significant. Smaller countries in terms of their population and smaller countries in terms of their, their area, their geography, how big they are. So it's, it basically says that for smaller nations, it's easier to identify young talents and to bring them together in one training center than it is probably for larger countries. It could be an assumption that uh, this is the case. Now, and that probably also explains why this pillar is not so well developed in most nations. Interesting to see is also that the scores for talent identification are much lower than they are for talent development. Pretty logical, uh, this pillar should actually be analyzed on a sport by sport basis and not on an overall sport by sp uh, sport level except from what can a national policy do to identify talents and to help their national governing bodies so that they can identify all the potential talents in their country. In pillar five, 
the athletic and post-career approach, um, there is an increasing holistic approach towards the athletic career. And uh, what, it, what, it, what we clearly see is that more nations tend to provide a, a wage for athletes to be able to full-time train, to be able to train on a full-time basis. But it's interesting to see that the scores are pretty high in almost all countries. So possibly, if countries would, like, would have to make a choice um, where to start investing in, they will probably all start in investing in their elite athletes, supporting them with a wage and possibly other services. The differences between the countries are especially found in the way they develop uh, these, service, these different services. Um, so the Netherlands, Spain, Australia are uh, paying much attention to the holistic approach or the different services that athletes receive once they start to perform. But also Finland, Flanders, Canada, Denmark, Switzerland uh, do pretty well. And we have a few countries here around the average. And again, uh, Brazil could still learn from what other countries do in this respect. France is also um, doing good. Key success ingredients. Uh, as I already mentioned, the monthly income or athletes that have a sufficient income so that they can spend enough time to their training um, is an important factor. And when we look at top 16 athletes only, uh, the average wage, where we had to make a selection because there were a lot of outliers, so we made uh, athletes earning more than 300,000 euros, we have seen that as an outlier. We might have to change that in the future and make it lower. Uh, but having these numbers, Korea, Finland, this is the order of what the athletes have responsible responded to us, top 16 athletes, their average income from direct payments or wages, reimbursements, <coughs> and price money. Interesting to see is also that uh, in Korea, for example, it is the highest, but the largest <coughs> part of that also comes from government and direct funding and wages that they receive. Now, what I find more important is that still, it is 70% of all the top 16 athletes, so of a sample of around 1,200 top 16 athletes, receive a monthly salary for their sport, which is quite high. But still 25% of athletes that are full-time being an athlete, so doing nothing else than being an athlete, still indicated that they earn less than, less than 10,000 euros. So it means that they probably get some support for their career, but they really focus on their sport because they want to. And it may delay their career, of course, on the longer term, because they only focus on their sport without having a wage. And they will probably need a lot of support from their whole environment in that. This is a slide just showing how equal the, the support services scores are for uh, top level, um, top 16 athletes. So they receive different support services uh, according to elite athletes are the green bars and according to elite coaches are the are the blue bars in post-career support it was noticed that most countries increase their attention paid to developing athletes and their post-career careers but they mainly do it during the sport career of an athlete by preparing them and facilitating them for example with elite sport and studies or, or by giving them extra attention and coaching but what is underestimated is that athletes are worried about what happens after their career and some countries also support their athletes once and once their career has ended for example with finding a job for example, financially, because they are have often had a delay in their, um, in, their, uh, in their career. And we asked the statement to the athletes, that we asked to rate concerns about my future prospects outside sports negatively affect my ability to focus fully on being an athlete. And we asked them to rate that statement where we can still see that while well, 30% overall of these athletes is worried about that or indicates to be worried about that 
that it should be a point of attention, especially in Portugal, Northern Ireland, Brazil, Korea, and Estonia. Uh, but in all countries, as long as it was during the career, they did well. Post-career is, is still developed in a limited level. And we know from other research that that might be reasons why athletes want to end their sports career. Another uh, pillar, this is pillar seven, concerns coaches. And the coaches pillar was an important pillar in relation to success. That relation was higher in winter sports than it is in summer sports. It's the only pillar where the relationship was stronger for winter sports. Now I would like to refer to uh, Marcel Sturkenboom from the Netherlands a few years ago who mentioned that if you have the ingredients, you still don't have a good recipe. It's how you bring the ingredients together is what counts. And that is exact, exactly the role of the coach. So the question is then, what can a national policy do to have better coaches? And if we look at those ingredients that are significantly related with success, we find the highly income of the coaches, a well-developed coaches system and the education system, the continuously development of coaches, <coughs> a sufficient number of coaches that is qualified in the country, the, a strategy to attract world's best coaches, transfer of knowledge, communication, interdisciplinary correlation, collaboration, which means that coaches have enough opportunity to exchange information with each other, a coordinated support program so that not only the athletes can be a full-time athlete, but also coaches can be a full-time coaches. So nations have developed systems so that coaches are paid on a full-time basis. A written work contract, which uh, determines a bit their, um, their social situation and their, um, their the recognition of the job of a coach. Uh, and then having a database of what coaches in the country have which level. Uh, looking at the scores of uh, Pillar 7, the coach provision and coach development, Canada has the best score of all other countries and the coach education system in Canada is very well developed and very uh, much coordinated also with the different uh, research centers in Canada. Um, also Australia, Switzerland uh, do well. The averages are also quite high. Um, they are almost 60%. Countries that do worse are Brazil. And uh, as you can see, we have a lot of countries that are around that middle. Uh, basically because coaches do not get the opportunities enough to, to get um, to, to increase their expertise and to become a world-class coach, coach at an international level, because that is something that should not be developed at a national level. I've decided to reduce the presentation a bit uh, to come to a next part. So uh, I will summarize uh, the three other pillars. And the first statement or conclusion was that uh, a network of sufficiently high quality national training centers with full-time access for athletes is highly valued. Basically, countries that have national training center where athletes can uh, train on a full-time basis, but not just that, also that athletes have priority access in their own environment uh, to the elite sports facilities are basic factors uh, where good performing countries do better. Uh, countries with a higher level of coordination uh, and planning of international events do not necessarily organize more events. Uh, that is an interesting one. Uh, and there are a few examples of that. But Japan was a country that did both good, that did well on both elements, national coordination, uh, national um, organization of international events. Some strange uh, findings with Canada that also had good scores. On the other hand, if we ask athletes, coaches, and performance directors, what their thoughts about that was, is that they still felt that not enough international <coughs> events are organized in the country. So I think that uh, asks some re reflection for the Canadian policy makers. And then the last one, uh, I, would, I wish I had more time for it because it's an interesting one, but I will show you the ne next slide. Scientific research was highly rated uh, and highly related the success in uh, summer and winter sports of all the countries. 
uh, which could actually mean that it is an area for future development. If countries want to win, to have a, a competitive advantage more than they have now, well, countries with money will basically put efforts into that pillar. And we can see, as Simon already told, uh, the Japanese Institute of Sports Science, also the National Trainings Institute of the, of the Australian Institute of Sport, um, are important issues in this regard. Now, if we look quickly at these scores, uh, we can basically see, and that is also a good note, is that Pillar 6, which are the training facilities, are high scores in almost all the countries, with a few exceptions in Brazil, Northern Ireland, and also Wallonia. The exceptions are related to the fact that athletes and uh, coaches they are in the opinion that they cannot uh, access their facilities at the right moments, time of the day, that they have too much time spent on traveling to get to their right facilities, and they are rating sometimes the quality quite high, but the availability is rated much lower. Uh, in pillar eight, sorry, was too quick, Pillar 8, uh, the, sc the scores are around average, where we can see Japan here as the best performing country. Also, Spain is doing well. Pillar 8 is the international competition. And it's not just about organizing international competition in your own country. The pillar is all also about being able to participate sufficiently in the national competitions in your own country. And also about being able to participate sufficiently in international competitions. So um, that is an important one. For Pillar 9, you can see that the scores at the bottom are more red, the scores at the top are more green, with, an ex with a very high score for Australia, and I will come back on that also in one of the next slides. Uh, to get the overview of all the pillars, and it's not so easy with so many data, so we tried to get a look at it, well, what can we generally learn from it uh, if we try to have a, a general pillar overview. The reason why this has this asterisk is for the reasons I have just explained, that, they, uh, that we should be cautious with comparing these scores of these nations with others. Now I have ranked the nations now according to their level of success in summer sports. And we can see that uh, although Spain uh, it has no success at all in winter sports, Canada was more successful, of course, in winter sports, so it would be ranked at the top if we would look at them. Uh, and then Switzerland and Finland are mainly countries that do much better in winter sport. Denmark is also an interesting country because it's still, it still, it's, it colors red, but for being such a small country, uh, winning uh, nine medals in, uh, in London is a, is a pretty good performance. This is the overview of all the traffic lights, and the point I want to come to is, let's have a, a look at it from a distance and see, well, countries that perform better, do we also find more green there? Countries that perform worse, do we also find more red there? And in which pillars can we clearly notice this? Uh, in the financial pillar and in the scientific research, we can not as strongly find it, but also find it in the organization coaches and competition. And here we can see that these uh, scores are much lower compared to the other countries. So pillar three and four are not a priority pillar uh, for countries that want to invest in elite sport or that want to uh, win more medals. And that of course raises some question for uh, the short term or the long term development. Pillar five and six, are two pillars where all countries do quite good, except from Brazil. Now, in the beginning, we, thought we started with saying what are the countries that perform above the average, and that were France, Australia, Japan, and the Netherlands, that given their resources, they do well. So let's have a look only at these four countries and try to find out where do these countries all do well in, and we come to the same conclusion that all these countries have a well-developed athletes, facilities, coaches, and research. And an exception is a little bit uh, the financial situation, because the Netherlands does not spend that much money into elite sport. And therefore, I think that the Netherlands is an interesting country to have a look at because it might mean that they do more with less money. So let's deeper 
let's little, go a little bit deeper onto that uh, later on. When we look at it for winter sports, through the relationships are less clear than they are for summer sports. Um, and that, that will basically be also one of the elements to conclude regarding our pillar model. Um, but we can find, well, at least no red scores in the organization, facilities, athletes and coaches. The scores are, are a little bit, the relationship is a little bit lower, but it's, it's, it's still uh, showing some of the relationships. But as well interesting is looking at the bottom line, where we find more, more red, with the exception of Denmark, uh, which, which is pretty well organized in the lead sports policy, although it's much more decentralized than many other countries do, and they would, for example, also much more collaborate with their municipalities uh, in regard to elite sports. And they are the only country that does, uh, uh, that does focus on collaboration with municipalities. Um, I think that the most interesting country here to pick out of that is Brazil, because there are two pillars where they do well, the finance and the competition. So I decided to focus a little bit, uh, to go a little bit deeper into these two countries that I found so interesting. Brazil, such a big country, and the Netherlands, <coughs> such a small country. How, what is the difference between uh, both countries? And if we summarize uh, the, the context a bit of these countries, then um, Brazil is 250 times bigger than the Netherlands. And it has a population that is 13 times higher than the Netherlands. It is, um, it is not uh, wealthier if we look at GDP per capita than the Netherlands has more money per inhabitant. Uh, and if we look at the medals in London, well, uh, Brazil won 17 medals, of which 20% was gold. And the Netherlands won 20, of which 40% was gold. So that is pretty much equal. So the question to be raised could be, why is the Netherlands so successful? And I'm not going into depth on the key ingredients again, but if there are Brazilian people here and Dutch people, the slides are hidden, so you can ask me afterwards if you want. Um, but to see an evolution in the success, what is interesting is that Brazil also did not have that host effect as much as other countries have it. They only won two medals more than Beijing, whereas, um, other, whereas uh, there is an estimation made that it should be, or it could be 10 medals more compared to the, as a host uh, nation. Interesting in the Netherlands is also that they had their maximum performances in Sydney where the Netherlands raised their top 10 ambition. It's an ambitious country, and they want to be part of the top 10 of the world. And that's the ambition they go for. And whether they, they reach that ambition in 2000, the performance is slightly decreased, but uh, 20 medals for a country with less than 70 million inhabitants is quite interesting. The funding of both countries, what is spent on elite sport, well, uh, it's, it's 2.7 times more in Brazil, and if we would include the state companies, which we probably cannot do straight away the way I do it now, uh, that it would be 3.9 times. Now, when we look at the scores of Brazil on the nine pillars, we can here find the averages of all the um, other countries, of all the 16 countries, and Brazil has two scores where they are above the average financial support, and they are around the average for the organization of international competition, which we all know uh, with the upcoming um, football and Olympic Games organized in Brazil. But um, in all the other pillars, they perform below the average. So if we would ask the question, is Brazil ready for 2016 in terms of policies and in terms of making progress with their athletes, I think that Brazil can still learn a lot from the other countries. And 2016 might be too early, but if they would well invest in national coordinated policies and, and in the nine pillars, they would probably have a lot of room to increase their, um, their medal potential development. When we add the Netherlands to that, interesting is that the Netherlands has a strength at the right side of this rather graph. 
in sports participation, talent development, and the athletic career support. And they, are, they do not have scores below the average on all the other pillars, uh, except for the financial support that is slightly um, below the average. Um, now, as interesting is that if we now look at the good performing countries only, do they all then do the same like the Netherlands? Would they all perform in pillar, well, in pillars three, four, five? We already noticed that they do not. But it is an important issue because countries may have different ways in which they invest in elite sport. They may have different blends of critical success factors and they may have, the, the best performing countries may have a different competitiveness in certain pillars. So let's see, let's look at the traffic lights of a few other countries, uh, beginning with Australia. What is interesting is that the scores of Australia are above the average of all the countries, except from one, the international competition. And that is uh, probably what Australians would expect uh, looking at the geography of the country and the disadvantage that Australian athletes have to compete in an international competition. On the other hand, the advantage that European athletes have because traveling within Europe only takes a few hours. So that is uh, obviously also clear in this pillar and the maximum score is, is the strength of Australia. Research, innovation, is it has its strength, it has had the highest score of all uh, the countries. When we add to that Japan, we do not see that same spider web for Japan. It differs a little bit, and that makes it interesting. Good performing countries do something di some things differently, although they also do well in uh, Pillar 9, the scientific research, but they have the best scores of all the countries in the international competition and the training facilities. And, um, and I think that adds also value, but as interesting as also when we compare to the Netherlands that basically had its strength all at this side, uh, this moves from countries with less money being spent on elite sport to countries with more money that will invest it in pillars that are probably also more expensive <coughs> to invest in. Uh, adding Canada to that, Canada is also doing pretty well uh, in the Olympics and also in the pillars, with the exception of talent identification and development, a big country, but also no national coordination of, for example, elite sport and study systems. What does it mean? It means that an athlete and a coach depend on their on themselves to be able to combine elite sport and studies. Although there are a few provinces in Canada that organize it, but at a general level, it, it was not positively evaluated also by the athletes and the coaches. Canada has a strength in coach development, as I already mentioned. So we have seen here three different countries with different strengths. And this way, I assume that these three countries can learn from each other, but these countries can also learn from the Netherlands that did well here. And the Netherlands will probably be able to learn more at this side uh, of the pillar of the rubber graphs. There are many Belgians in this room, so I also wanted to show uh, the traffic light of my own country. And um, Flanders is the northern part, Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. What I find interesting about it is that we did this study in 2008, and Flanders performed below the average on all the pillars. It had its biggest gaps in the financial support, in the post-career uh, support, and in the coach development. Now, a few years later, there has a lot has happened in Flemish policies. The investments have tripled over the past 10 years, and it shows that also these investments have led to some uh, more, some bad, some improvements in the pillars. Now, Flanders has its strength in pillar four, uh, although we all know that it can also be improved in many ways. But compared to athletes at the national level, they we have. Uh, um, a situation where many countries would envy us on their elite sport and study systems. There are also uh, things we can learn from other countries in terms of individual approaches, but that is the strength of Flanders. Now, adding Wallonia to that is also interesting because in 2008, Wallonia was below the average on all the pillars and they are still below the average 
on these pillars, also with an exceptional pillar for talent development. So I think in our country, it is necessary that both parts, both regions start probably collaborating, learning from each other and improving um, their elite sports policy. So despite the increasing investments in Wallonia, they are still lower than Flanders, they do not, did not catch up in the same way. So I think the whole country can still learn from many other countries, but also from each other. And then to end with uh, some conclusions, and it's basically a summary of, uh, of what I have already said to come to some points. Um, the starting point of what we do is this policy important. When I talk to Colato, for example, which is a private company in Belgium, they would basically ask, ask the question, policy is not important. We do not need policy to be successful. Well, I think that with our results, we can clearly show that countries with a good coordinated approach to policy development, they do better in international competition. An athlete does, should not depend on its policy, but the policy should facilitate so that the, the athlete can uh, perform well and develop well. Even uh, e equally important is, of course, that there are other factors playing a role. And for example, with regard to Flanders, the budget of 22 million euros could be simply not enough to perform at another level. But there are many other critical success factors within that, within that same amount of money where we could learn from other countries. So we could conclude, I think, that policy is not a guarantee, guarantee for success. It can contribute, and it's just not sufficient to have the ingredients. The second conclusion of uh, the split study so far is we know that more money in equals more medals out but it does not automatically lead to a complementary uh, increase of medals, and that is related to the more strategic approach that different countries have towards elite sport uh, policy. So a model just simply costs more uh, than it did in the past. If we would ask ourselves what are the pillars for, of effectiveness, and that's why I showed them through the traffic lights previously, uh, is that the best performing countries, they all do well in financial support, governance <coughs> organizations, sports science, the blue ones here are the significant as well. All countries of our sample did well in training facilities and post-career support. <coughs> to a smaller extent, the correlation is less strange, but it does is significant in uh, coach provision and in international competition. And I show this here with this pillar overview for the scientists among you. Uh, but the, the blue ones are the significant ones, and there are three pillars that are significant both for summer sports and winter sports. Pillar one is the financial support, pillar two is the organizational structure, and pillar nine is the research in elite sport. Pillar seven, the coaches, is more important, more significant in um, winter sports, and uh, pillar eight, international competition is more important in summer sports. I'll come back to that in the final uh, slide. Um, we have found that the, the scores were relatively weak in pillars three and four. So what do we do with that? And an assumption that could be made is that nations aiming at a short-term success will not invest in these two pillars. Uh, but these pillars can contribute to success on the longer term because of the supply of young talents and be, uh, the supply of um, athletes towards their career uh, development. And um, it could be that as smaller nations did better on this pillar, also nations that do not well perform well in international competition do basically invest in these pillars. It could be that larger nations would gain a competitive advantage when they would start investing, especially in a better sports participation and talent um, identification and development, which would of course make the prospects for smaller nations also uh, not poorer. There is room for the diversity, is a fifth conclusion. Um, we have seen also from literature that there is an increasing homogeneity between countries. 
that they are basically, over time, they have copied systems like from Australia and from the former communist country. And that has led to uh, investing in similar pillars. The key pillars are the same in many countries. And when we look closer, we see variations in the way they combine different critical success factors. So there is still room for diversity. And that might also depend on how countries apply the policy and the different factors to their own policy context and their different situations. So uh, while there is an increasing um, homogeneity, there will also be an increasing variation between how countries develop their elite sports policies. Um, interesting notice is also the terms bench learning and benchmarking where just, we usually use benchmarking, but more important is that nations just take these critical success factors that are most and best applicable to their, uh, the, to their own situation. And then finally, summer sport, winter sport, I found this an interesting one, because it appears that most pillars are more correlated to success in summer sports, and only pillar seven correlate more in winter sports. So it may also reflect that our pillar model is not suitable yet to develop it for winter sports. And a possible explanation for that might be that in winter sports, there are more commercial like, developments um, and, and it is less depending on a national coordination, for example, in ski resorts and, and ski clubs. So I believe that there is a need for further validation for this model also in winter sports, which will actually be uh, the team the of the PhD of one of the students here, Andreas uh, Weber. Yeah, so I would like uh, to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I think it's not uh, possible now, but during the lunch break, just come to me and we discuss it. Thank you.